John 3.16. The more I hear about what's going on in so many lives by prayer requests and what's going on in this day and time, I, I believe as we gather, we're not disappointed if we're just focused on being encouraged from God's Word. We, we all need encouragement. And so my heart's kind of where it was last week that, that we just might share some encouragement from, from the Word of the Lord and let Him bless tonight as we consider God's love. For the, for the text verse, I'd just like to ask that, that we all quote John 3.16 together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. God's love. How do we define it? Is it easy to define? It's endless, really, if you think about us defining God's love. How do we explain it? When someone asks us about God's love, how, how do we expound on this wonderful love of God? Some people say that it's impossible to convey the depths of God's love just merely in, in the words that we say. And, and I have a, a lot most agreement with that statement um, we can't imagine the affection of the heart of God and how He attaches that to you and I. You know, God's love is manifested in His acts of grace. So we see His love in His grace. He, he blesses and God offers blessing to you and I. And where we may not know it all when it comes to God's love until we get to heaven, look, we're, we learn about it in His Word. We're, we're told about God's love in His Word. He has proved His love to us. And children of God experience His love in our lives. So, let us share what we can about God's love for a few minutes this evening. What words, you know, might we use to, to just be locked in that we might leave and be thinking about these words tonight? Some key words, you know, to explain God's love. And how about great? God's love is great. How about we prove how great that love is tonight? By the Word of God. God's love is great because there's no performance for it. To earn it. To get it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, we're, we're going to see what we were, and we're going to see what we are now, and we're going to see what, what God did in, in His great love to make it happen. So Ephesians 2, beginning of the chapter, says, And you hath He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also... We all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
we have not earned a life in Christ that the child of God has. But God, in His great love, has made us alive in Christ. We have been quickened, the Bible says, together with Christ. I was just talking to someone about the King James Version before we got started. And I, I love the King James Version. I love the words of it. That word quickened, quickened, it means to be made alive. There's nothing that we have done in and of ourselves to make us alive unto God. This is something that God has done in His great love to us. In the first portion of the verses that we just shared, we see what we were. It tells us that we were dead spiritually. And, and what that dead life was like and how it's described. In the last portion of the verses, we are told about a life in Christ that, that the child of God now has. We did not change our ways to go from dead in sins to alive unto God. We didn't try to do better in order for this to happen. It was not our determination and our drive that took us from dead in sins to being able to be alright with God, to being made alive with God. There is nothing in and of ourselves, no determination, no drive that is going to cause that to happen. On our part, it was simply a decision. A decision that we made to place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. And when He saved us, I, I really don't like to talk about anything somebody did in order to get saved. I, I know that we, we profess Christ, it's our decision, but He does the saving. He, that's the only kind of saving that sticks. It was a decision we've made to believe in Jesus. And when we did, God quickened us. He made us alive to Christ by His great love. So, so how would we describe His love tonight? As great, because there's no performance for it in order to get it. But we might consider something else. There's no prejudice in God's love. That makes it great. John 3.16 again. For God so loved the world. That's everyone. That's everyone there has ever been. That is everyone in the human race. God did not just give His Son to die for some. There, there are not those that, that, that He selected ahead of time and, and caged up others that they could not possibly be saved. God loved the entire world and gave His Son for the whole world. He didn't give His life for some of the people. He didn't give His life for those on a few continents of this world. He gave His Son's life for the entire world. He didn't and doesn't offer salvation for people just of one or two different skin colors. He gave His Son to die for everyone of, of every ethnicity uh, in the entire world. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the entire human race. God is impartial. His Word says that He is no respecter of persons. He is fair. He is just. He treats everyone equal. Everyone has an equal opportunity to be able to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the simple verse, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that verse. Revelation 22.17 It's a welcome to everyone to be saved because of God's great love. The verse says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. 
And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Is that not beautiful? Is that not the most beautiful invitation? The most welcoming invitation you've ever heard? And it's to the greatest thing there could possibly be. To come to know Jesus who forgives us of our sins, who provides a home in heaven, who signs us up for it now by, by way of our citizenship. God has a great love for every single person, every single person that we pass throughout our lives. God has a great love for them. It doesn't matter what their name is. It doesn't matter what their skin color is. It doesn't matter how they talk. It doesn't matter how they walk. They may not know God's love. They may not know that God loves them. But God has a great love for all. There's no performance for it. There's no prejudice in it. And there is proof of it. We have the proof of God's love. God's great love is proven by His great sacrifice. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. People are always wanting to prove their love to others. Or, or maybe, maybe someone is wanting someone else to prove their love to them. God did that. How did God prove His love to us? God gave His only Son for us. How about that? How, how about that news? How about that reality that God gave His Son for all of us while we were, while we were sinners, unworthy, undeserving? It wasn't a gift we deserved. God commendeth His love toward us, has clearly shown His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Hebrews 2.9 tells us what He gave His Son over to for us. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And that word taste in the King James Version, it means to experience. Jesus experienced the death that belonged to you and I. And this came forth from the heart of Almighty God and His love, God's love for us, in that He gave His Son 1 Corinthians 13 talks about how love suffers. It talks about how love seeketh not her own, beareth all things, and endureth all things. Jesus Christ loves us. Jesus Christ gave His life for us. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood. He loved us and he washed us from our sins with his own blood because he gave his life in our place. He took the death that belonged to you and I for our sins. He took that upon Him. God has provided a great sacrifice, His own love, His own Son, to prove His love for us. His love is great. How, how do we describe this love? How, how about great? How about how far it reaches? How about the far-reaching love of God. How, how far does it reach? Well, how about this? How about from heaven to earth? It's from heaven to earth, by the way, because Jesus existed before He was conceived in the womb of Mary. It's amazing how many people think Jesus got their start 
when he was born of a, of a virgin, born of Mary, here on this earth. And so that's why I bring it up so much. It's a, but Jesus pre-existed before he was on this earth. It doesn't take much to figure out the timeline of when Jesus was here in the flesh and when Abraham was upon this earth. Who, who was first? Who, who, was, who was first on this earth in the flesh? Abraham was, was first on this earth in, in the flesh. However, Jesus says in John eight fifty eight, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Christ confirmed His own pre-existence before He came in the flesh to this earth. The Apostle Paul confirmed his pre-existence. And, and you can turn there if you want to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Before we start in verse 15, let's look in verse 14 to see who we're talking about here. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's none other, I would say, than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let, let me go ahead and read the verse after 15 through 19. Just to make sure. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven, Jesus Christ. Now let's look as the Holy Spirit gave Paul the words of the preexistence of Jesus Christ. It says, he says, who is the image of the invisible God? the firstborn of every creature. For by Him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell." God the Holy Spirit gave Paul the, the revelation of the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I say, how far reaching is the love of God from heaven to earth? And why? Why did Jesus Christ come to this earth? Well, Luke 19.10, Jesus tells us, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Honestly, Candy just gave her testimony of, of, of their salvation. And, and honestly, when I got saved, I, I thought I was doing pretty good because there was something that had me determined to get up and, and go to church on Sunday mornings. I'd, I was going once a month for a while, and I thought that, that the heavens were proud of me for it or something. And then all of a sudden, I was wanting to go more. And, and all of a sudden, I got saved. And man, I thought I, I, really, I really sought this thing out. And it happened. But that's not what happened at all. Jesus was seeking me the whole time. No man cometh unto the Father except that the Father draw him. That, that, fish, that fish is not trying to get to you holding that fishing rod on the bank. He, he doesn't want to get to you. But that hook's in his mouth, and you're bringing him, you know, no matter what. He, the, he's headed to you. No man cometh unto the Father except that the Father draw him. It's our decision. It's our decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he draws us. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth. That's how far-reaching God's love is. And He came to seek and to save that which is lost. I didn't, I didn't know I was lost. In a sense, I can say that. I had made a profession of faith before. 
And, and I was uncertain. I was having doubts. And God made it clear I was lost and saved my soul. The love of God brought heaven's perfect love to fallen man on this sin-cursed earth. John 3.17 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The prosperity preachers love a portion of that verse. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. And they really go to town on that. I wish they would have gone to the next verse to see why He didn't come to condemn the world. And that's because the world was already condemned. Because of Adam's sin, look, everyone, everyone begins with a sin nature and is unacceptable to God. And it is only when we realize we're a sinner and that has separated us from God and will do so for all eternity in hell, it's only then that that we realize and are saved from our sins. Everyone begins condemned. The whole world is is already condemned. So Jesus came to seek and to save. How far-reaching is God's love? From heaven to earth. But how about we measure it out this way? From holy God to sinful man. That's a far-reaching love. From holy God to sinful man. We, are you ready for this? God's love, God's great love, God's far-reaching love. We are the objects of God's love. We are the target that He wants to hit with His love. 1 John 4.19 says He first loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. We weren't looking for His love. We didn't want His love. We weren't asking for His love. But He sent His love. And He sent it to you and I. From holy God to sinful man. He sent His love to penetrate our deceitful and desperately wicked hearts. Never forget the first time I opened my Bible to I I just tried to follow some of the older saints and when I got saved I, I got to church early and I sat and I opened my Bible up and I opened it and Jeremiah 17 was right there and I got to verse 9 and it said it said that my heart was deceitful and desperately wicked and no one is left out of that. I, I walked, you want, you want to know what I did? I walked around the sanctuary and I showed it to people. I said, are you kidding me? Look at, some people didn't like hearing it. It's, man, I had just been saved, but I knew that everything in this book was the truth. And I could trust God. And, and how great is His love that, that, that deceitful and hearts like ours would be the target of His love. Sounds too good to be true, but it's true. And we are. We didn't want His love, but He sent it. He sent it to penetrate those hearts of ours. And then His love reached beyond that. From heaven to earth, from holy God to sinful man. And then, and then how about this? From sinful man to holy man. Let, let, me, let me go ahead and throw this out there to, to try to clear that up. There, there's a saying that is very scriptural. God loves us so much, He'll save us just as we are. Okay? But God loves us too much to leave us as we are after He saves us. So He's changing us. How far reaching is God's love from holy God to sinful man and beyond from sinful man to holy man? 1 John chapter 3, I'm going to read the first nine verses. John says, Behold what manner of love 
the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself even as He is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Most of us know this, but it's important enough to point it out to even if just one needs to understand this, that we are not perfect yet. You know, we will be in heaven. It's not going to happen while our feet are on this earth. This book, you, you find when you study it in the, in the Greek language that this book is written in the continuous sense. As far as sin, and if you notice there, someone maybe where it said that they do not commit sin, it's not in the habitual continual sense. It's not dominating our lives. And so, from sinful man to holy God, His love continues though. Jesus was manifested to take... Notice He wasn't made. He was manifested in the flesh. He wasn't made. That that wasn't His beginning. He was manifested in the flesh to take away our sins. And it goes on to say that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Jesus came to save us. And he didn't leave the saved here to act like the unsaved. He didn't leave the saved here to love this world. To know Christ... And to walk with Christ is going to cause us to not be friends with this world. And as we walk with Christ, it's not like we need to have a determination and a checklist. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. The world will find you wearing the wrong kind of deodorant, if you know what I mean. The world will leave you when you walk with Christ. And Jesus came to save us, and He's left us here to be changed. Not to be happy, but to be holy. The Bible says, be ye holy. And that's not going to happen by our own determination. That's going to happen by walking with Christ. As this is described in 1 John to us, we find the word in verse 2, Beloved. Beloved. He, he loves us and His love reaches from sinful man to take, uh, taking us to holy man. God's love not only reaches out to us, but takes us to holiness. Let's, let's not just consider the, the distance. I I, I was kind of overwhelmed with that. From heaven to earth and beyond, God's love reaches. But let us also consider, not only that His love came a long way in distance, but, but let's try to look at some depth of this love as we start to close.
You know, the, the song says, He paid a debt He did not owe. We owed a debt we could not pay. And God offered that debt paid for us. He, he offers it freely. He gives it freely. It's only freely received. I, I, don't know, I don't know how someone can receive true salvation if they think a baton is in their hand and they've got, to, they've got to maintain it, they've got to run with it, they've got to take care of it. That, that is our duty for the Lord, but not for a position in heaven. But because we have one, we're going to live for Him and serve Him. It's only freely received. I probably told you about Thanksgiving at my mom's house too many times, so, so I'll just give you a short version. Uh, we, we've taken people, we've taken people from church up to my mom's house in years past for Thanksgiving, and people always wanted to bring something. <laughs> I just shake my head. You don't know my mama. You're not bringing anything. You'd, well, well, we'll do dishes. We'll do something. And you, and you'd get there to my mom's house, and she was kind of hypersensitive about it. You try to grab some salt to salt your food, and she's going to grab it and do it for you. You're not going. You aren't going to do anything at Thanksgiving dinner at my mama's house, but receive it. All right. That's the only way we can have salvation in Jesus Christ is to freely receive what He has freely given. I, I don't know how we can have it any other way. I don't know how you can get it any other way than than to obey the way He offers it. That we're bankrupt. We're, we're sinful. We can do nothing. We cannot quicken ourselves. He quickens us. He saves us. He offered it freely. It must be received freely. We kind of started out remembering that God's love is manifested through His acts of grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk therein. So God reached out to us in His love. How far reaching is it? By depth. He owed us absolutely nothing. But He reached out to us in His love. Not all, and, and that freely given and freely offered business, that's free on our end. But, but if we want to think about the far-reaching depths of God's love, let us think about what it cost God to offer us a free salvation. It, it cost Him His Son. He gave the life of His Son. He gave His Son to suffer in our place. So, our salvation couldn't have been a higher cost for God. It's free to us. But it cost Him everything. It cost Him His Son. God owed nothing, but He paid our debt with His Son's life. This stands as the clearest evidence and the most undeniable proof that God loves us with an everlasting love. There are two places of eternal destiny that people are going to go. People are going to go to heaven, and people are going to go to hell. None of them are going to go to either place unloved by God. God loves everyone. He loves us all and gave His Son for us. This great and far-reaching love, it's extending right now. It's, a, it's extending right now for you and I to have experience of it. I, I, I pray and I hope our prayer is that, that we would want more of an experience of His love. As I say that, 
when we were saved, we, could, we, we couldn't have received any more of His love than we did when we were saved. We received all of it. How about our experience of that love? Just a closer walk with Thee that we might experience this love even more that is, that is reaching to us now. And if you're here tonight and you're unsaved, man, that's a great realization. In a sense, that's a celebrating realization to come to. It's exciting to realize that because in that very moment, God's drawing your heart that you might be saved. Because His love is reaching to you right now and beyond you. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and He's seeking hearts right now. That someone who is unsaved might be saved. I, I pray it's tonight. But if you're unsaved and you leave that way, at least you might know this. That is, you are without a doubt absolutely loved by God. He, he loves you. And, and this love is proven by His Son. He gave His Son. That, that's everything. That's everything in life for anyone. God the Son, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, our King. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's Christ. He's, he's our Deliverer. He's eternal life. He's, he's faithful and true. He's God. He's our high priest. He's Emmanuel. He's Jesus. He's the lily of the valley. He's the Messiah. He's, he's everything in life. And we really have nothing without Him. I pray you don't leave without Him tonight if you don't know Him. but that you'll at least knowing, know, leave knowing that He loves you tonight. But may you trust Him. May you trust Him to, to save you from your sins. You, you will not be rejected. You will not in no wise be cast out. He died to save every single one of us. And, and I'm going to ask that we have a hymn invitation tonight. And I didn't prepare anybody for that. But if we could do that tonight, as, as God's working on hearts, we're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And, and it just may be that you, need a, you, you want to pray tonight. It may be that you want to go over to somebody and pray with them. It may be that, that you realize on this Wednesday night that you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we pray that you'd be saved this evening. Or that you just, you just obey God as He speaks to your heart. Father in heaven, we do bow in your house tonight. We humble ourselves and we thank you for a time in your word. I, I thank you for helping me to convey a few thoughts of, of yours. I thank you for the power of your word, Lord. And, and how you use it continually in our lives. And it's never going to pass away. Lord, may you be glorified tonight. I thank you that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. You tell us that in your word. So, Lord, you have your way in the hearts of those tonight who need to obey you in, in many different ways for many different things. Whatever it is, Lord, you know it. We pray that you would work and move even now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can stand if you'd like.